influence of the LH and FSH starting to increase because the GNRH, GNRH levels have increased after the negative feedback from the end of the cycle. With increasing numbers of follicular cells, all right, estrogen levels are, are going to rise. The high estrogen level, moderately high estrogen level, results in LH being secreted, and then we have ovulation. The corpus luteum now makes primarily progesterone, okay, and some estrogen, and that's going to continue unless it will fall off. That only lasts for about a, a nine days or so, um, and then it starts to fall. The last week it's falling, and then menses starts. So menses going to start back over here. <clears throat> the only thing, um, if pregnancy occurs, and there is fertilization of the egg by the sperm, that results in the release of uh, human chorionic gonadotropin. It's the HCG that pregnancy tests um, most commonly look for. That maintains the corpus luteum, so it doesn't degenerate, and it maintains levels of estrogen and progesterone, so the woman doesn't have her period and the embryo has an implantation site in which to embed. These are slides we went over last, last time. All right, so here's the spike in LH uh, as a result of the rise in GnRH. So we have the rise in estrogen having a positive feedback on GnRH. That results in a small spike in FH. FSH, but a very large spike in LH that increases the pressure fluid within the antrum and it results in ovulation. And now you can see as estrogens and progesterones are falling, we see the increase in GnRH and the subsequent increase in LH and FSH. <clears throat> so between, I'm not going to worry about the graph for GnRH, I want you to know that effect, all right? But if I have a graph of LH and FSH, a graph of estrogen and progesterone, again, you don't have to worry about inhibit, um, you should be able to identify which hormone you're looking at, okay? Uh, so if I just have a, a line drawing, and again, there will be two separate graphs because it'll work together on the same graph. You should be able to identify this as progesterone because it has its peak after ovulation. This is estrogen because it has the double peak. Okay. And this is LH because it has the highest spike prior to ovulation and um, FSH have been the lower. Now look at which one is higher prior to ovulation. FSH, all right? So that's partially why we see more estrogen. And then after ovulation, even though it's still relatively low, LH is higher than FSH, and therefore we see more of the progesterone forming rather than the estrogen. All right. So back to this um, ovary diagram that we looked at on Tuesday. So here is the mature antral follicle. The secondary oocyte has already formed with the first polar body. So this is just prior to actual ovulation. We have the rupture, the uh, release of the secondary oocyte with the first polar body, and the follicular cells around it. This structure that remains behind, there's a little bit of bleeding. And so it is known as the corpus hemorrhagicum, okay? Um, you can't really draw it there on the board, but I could label this one as it because it's the one that just ruptured. External cells shown out here. We have a corpus luteum, and then 
without fertilization occurring, it forms a corpus albicans. Okay, so if you count back to how many months you've ovulated, that's how many corpus albicans you have in your ovary. So here's um, what it looks like in the microscope. So each of these is a primary oocyte. Remember they're formed, they're found in the cortex around the ovary. They have flat molecular cells around them, just barely visible here. So this is a primary follicle. Again, your textbook calls it a primordial follicle. I leave that word out. We start with primary. Then it, those flat cells round up to become cuboidal. And whether it's a single layer or a multiple layer, it's a secondary follicle. So identical to what I drew over on the board. Now this is an early antral follicle. It has just a few cluster of spaces. They haven't yet coalesced together to form one large antrum. But as soon as you can see just one little small space, we change its classification to antral follicle. Now it's starting to get more organized. The antrum is getting larger. You can see the corona radiata attached to the A. This cluster or stalk down here is known as the uh, cumulus oophorus. Cumulus means cloud. Oophorus means um, egg. So the egg cloud, and that's what's ovulated, okay, is that cluster of cells. And this remains behind. This dark layer right here is the theca interna. So here's an image. Uh, it's the first uh, photograph of ovulation in the human. Um, it just kind of oozes out. It's not a squirt. And so here's that large antral follicle. You can see its size in relationship to the rest of the ovary. For comparison, this is a pair of hemostats. So you're seeing the tip um, of hemostats there. And then the um, follicle ruptures. And so that yellow um, material is the egg plus the follicular cells or granulosa cells around it. So then we have the corpus hemorrhagicum, and this is the corpus luteum. Okay. So the cells swell, they take on a lip, lot of lipid droplets, and secrete the estrogen and primarily progesterone, and then either after the pregnancy or, well, three months into the pregnancy when the placenta takes over, this will get smaller, or if fertilization doesn't occur, this starts to uh, get smaller last week of menses. So we see a decrease in progesterone without stimulus from um, other hormones produced by the, the embryo. The corpus luteum doesn't maintain its level of secretion. So those are, that's the ovarian changes, uh, the, the hormonal changes and the follicular changes. All right, now let's look at what the hormone is hormones are doing. So we have the uterine cycle. And what we're referring to here are the, is the stratum functionalis. This is on page 122. So at menses, remember, we're losing, that we're separating <coughs> stratum functionalis from stratum basalis. So menses, over the period of three to five days is a little more than a cup of primarily the connective tissue of the stratum functionalis mixed with blood. Okay? Seems like it's more than a cup, but that's about average of what it usually is. And so we lose the simple columnar surface and we come down to the stratum basalis. And then as our estrogen levels start to rise, estrogen is affecting the epithelial tissue and the fibroblasts. So we see the epithelial tissue undergo mitosis and completely repair the surface from the uterine glands. There is continued growth by the fibroblasts and we have an increase in thickness 
of the um, uterine, the stratum functionalis. So both gland and connective tissue increase in height under influence of estrogen. So this is known as the proliferative phase or the pre-ovulatory. After ovulation, estrogen is still high, so we continue to see an increase in the thickness. All right. And now we have progesterone. Remember, progesterone receptors are found on the blood vessels. And so they multiply, the blood vessels go more rapidly as do the uterine glands than they have room for, and so they start to coil. And we see highly coiled glands as well as highly coiled blood vessels are um, spiral arteries, and that's the post-ovulatory or secretory phase. So on the uterine tissues, you know, some of the slides will be labeled proliferative and secretory, but the terms pre-ovulatory and post-ovulatory apply. The secretory refers to the appearance of increased amounts of glycogen in the uterine glands, again in preparation for implantation. Now, uh, on Tuesday when we were doing female reproductive, we didn't talk about the uh, mammary gland, so I'm going to just flip back to that and talk about the role of the hormones on the mammary gland. right after talking about the erectile tissue. <clears throat> so page 108. Now, a couple of changes. About two years ago, when I was teaching this class, I had a student who um, was taking a class. Uh, she was going to go on and become a physician assistant and was working as a lactating specialist. And um, she was going to be absent for a while, so she um, didn't want to, was going to miss about uh, six weeks or so of the entire course. So she really just, kind of like you're doing this kind of set it on it, but I was talking about the structures, and so typically we have two phases of uh, the mammary gland, active and inactive, all right? There can, are subsets of that before puberty and after menopause types of things, but when we have act, inactive mammary activity, this is prior to ovulation, under influence of, you're seeing, um, under influence of estrogen, what we normally have without um, estrogen, higher levels of estrogen, is we have ducts surrounded by adipose tissue. Okay. Then with rising levels of estrogen during the menstrual cycle, the ducts are converted to secretory cells. We still have ducts, but then we see increased clusters of secretory cells that grow out from the ducts. So it's kind of like a, a bare tr tree um, branch in the wintertime, sprouting leaves, okay? And that's done under the influence of estrogen. This happens to be a lactating, so we actually have milk in the secretory cells. But on that first diagram, these alveoli that you see are not developed. Estrogen develops these, but we just have the ducts amongst the adipose tissue. And then estrogen causes the formation of these alveoli as secretory cells proliferate. So we always have the ducts, but estrogen creates the secretory alveoli. This happens each month. This is why some women have breast tenderness associated with their period. It's not going to be making milk because that requires what hormone? Oxytocin. Not oxytocin. Prolactin. 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 Okay. There's three hormones involved here. So prolactin is secreted as a result of pregnancy typically and will actually cause these secretory cells to start making the milk components, what we see in lactation. Oxytocin is involved in, there are cells that are similar, they're not actually muscle cells, but are similar in function. They can uh, have actin and myosin that can, um, I want a larger window, that can, are outside the base of these and can squeeze and cause uh, the, uh, cells to increase pressure and push uh, milk into the ducts. 
And so that increases, it's, it's called a milk letdown reflex. So a woman who is nursing, um, not always, um, hearing a baby cry, doesn't have to be her own, um, has a, a, a milk release without the baby actually sucking on the nipple. Typically, however, when the baby starts to suck, that signals a sensory um, back to the brain and oxytocin is released and there's a, a surge of milk release with that, with that suckling. Now, <clears throat> oxytocin, if you recall, also binds to uterine muscle. So this is helpful right after delivery to maintain the uterine contraction because that squeezes these spiral arteries that are torn at, with separation of stratum functionalis. And if the smooth muscle is squeezed tight around the radial arteries that supply them, that decreases bleeding. So a woman is encouraged to nurse as soon as possible after delivery. If she's not nursing, she's often given, or both of them can be given oxytocin IV to maintain that. You know, nurse will come in and check the height of the fundus, feel it, to feel if it's boggy. And if it's boggy, um, encourage the, the uh, mother to massage it herself to help maintain that. Now, with the, if she nurses her first baby, with the second baby, for some reason, the same process applies, but that's typically more painful. So when she starts to nurse, the uterine contractions are going to be much more, they're hardly feel them at all with the first child, but they often are more sudden and you know, you'll see her wince kind of a thing um, when the second baby starts to nurse, just for the first few days. It doesn't last the entire time the second baby is nursing but there's an increased sensitivity to that for some reason, the second go around. Now, back to this diagram on the ducts, and back to this uh, former student of mine. So you'll see in this pattern, uh, we have these um, mammary ducts that are outside the secretory tissue, and then lactiferous ducts. And then you'll see this dilation right here. Kind of looks like a little pool. Um, you can see it clearer here. That is called the lactiferous sinus, and this is how I was describing lecture. And uh, she was very polite. She didn't correct me during lecture. She came to me afterwards, and she, she said, you know, this is two years ago, she said, research has been done. Apparently, the anatomy of the mammary gland is based on one person's dissection of a cadaverous breast, and which he injected liquid wax into the ducts, and then trace the pathway and the structure of the ducts from that in every publication afterwards has continued with his description. And current work now shows that that dilation of the lactiferous sinus was due to the hot wax. And milk doesn't cause that. So if you look at a, a active, you know, I don't want to say a live x-ray, but like an MRI or like my son had an x-ray where he was swallowing radioactive, you could kind of see the milk going through, or the um, milkshake going through, <clears throat> that dilation doesn't occur with just milk. So the lactiferous sinus is now officially considered to be an artifact. Remember how we talked about the stratum lucidum? In skin, it was an artifact produced by the process and the shortening and the shrinking of the cells in the stratum spinosum. They're normally full and flush against each other, and the, their spiny appearance is an artifact. So now the official consensus has changed and lactiferous sinuses are an artifact. So even though they're still in our pictures, they, um, I'm not going to be asking you to identify them as such. So just lactiferous duct. Okay. Um, that brings them to a channel in the nipple, all right, where there's further uh, smooth muscle and then we have this areolar area around here. So estrogen not only affects the growth, of the uterine tissue of stratum functionalis, but increases the, converts the, many of the duct cells into secretory cells. They're still epithelial cells, all right, but obviously it's changing through the hormonal influence and affecting the genes, because this is a steroid and it's going to bind to receptors that affect what proteins are synthesized inside the cell. So we have new proteins, enzymes regulated, regulating milk synthesis. All right, so let's stop there, <laughs> and take a break. And
come back and do fertilization. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How or what would be the effect of say, say something about breast milk? 